Good evening, everyone. I'm Heather Young. I'm Dignity Health Dean's Leadership Chair at UC Davis and the founding dean of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. And I welcome here to you tonight to our community conversation uh, that I think is a very interesting topic. I'm so glad to see so many of you here tonight um, who represent so many aspects of our school. We have students, we have alumni, faculty, staff. Importantly, our National Advisory Council is here. This, this meeting is happening in conjunction with our National Advisory Council. I'd like to ask the members of the council to stand for a moment. Okay. Wave to the audience. <laughs> Before you sit down, Deb Greenwood is an alumna of our first PhD program, Helen Thompson, Russ Bell and Joanne Dish, you'll meet in a moment, and Janet Corrigan, who's the program officer at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So this meeting comes about tonight, for, it has a very interesting background to it. One of our National Advisory Council members a few years ago, Natalie Bush, said to us, you know, one of the things you could do at the School of Nursing is bring together people for very interesting conversations about unusual topics and invite people who have very different perspectives to those conversations. And she suggested an idea called the Jeffersonian Dinner which is an idea that President Jefferson had in his day to bring together people about very complex questions and engage in conversations. And we thought, well, that would be kind of fun. What should we start our conversation about? And we were lucky enough to have Doug Bush, who's National Advisory Council member emeritus on the board at the time. And he suggested and thought with us about, what about health and technology? That's such an important issue. And if we could bring together thought leaders from technology, from healthcare, health delivery, health payment, and have some conversations, wonder what, where that would go. And we were particularly interested in the question around Moore's Law. Now, at the School of Nursing, we care a lot about Moore's Law. <laughs> and some of you may not know what Moore's Law is, so I'll give you a quick, a little bit of an insight into this, and I beg forgiveness from the engineers who know this better. Um, but Gordon Moore, who of course was the co-founder of Intel, before he became famous for founding the school with Betty Moore, his, his <laughs> wife, um, he was asked in 1965 to write an article for Electronic Magazine. And the question was, what's going to happen with integrated circuits in the next decade? So Gordon sat down and wrote this article, and he said in that article that in the next, every 18 months to two years, you'd be able to get twice as much transistor on a silicon chip and that it would cost less as you go forward. Am I right, Ron? Am I right, Doug? Is that kind of right? Okay, close enough. Close. <laughs> and the idea being that there would be an acceleration of the innovations in technology. So when you think about it, the first computers were about as big as this building, and now we have more in our cell phones and our pockets in terms of power and capacity. If you were to put that in the automotive industry, so 1971 VW Beetle, that VW Beetle now would go 300,000 miles per hour, and it would need only one tank of gas in its entire lifetime, and it would cost four cents. <laughs> so, you know, innovation of that magnitude is really interesting to think about. So we thought, wow, you know, this is technology. They've been able to do that. Why can't we do something with our healthcare system? Because we have this thing called the triple aim, where we're supposed to improve quality, we're supposed to improve value, the experience for patients. And we seem to be having a lot of trouble doing that. So what could we learn from the health industry, from the technology industry? So we had a couple of dinners, and two of the members on the stage tonight were part of those dinners, and Doug and, and Ron in the audience were part of those, along with a number of other people. And I sat there and during these dinners just listening to a fantastic discussion, feeling incredibly selfish and incredibly privileged, because I was listening to these experts talk, and we were thinking, how could we make this available to more people? Um, our faculty, our students, our, our community members, our partners, all of you. How could we bring you into the conversation? So that's how this, this idea was born. And we thought it would be important to, to, in some respects, replicate that conversation and take it on. We want to really spark that type of thought and discussion among all of us so that we can actually move forward in achieving that triple aim in healthcare and learn from one another. So thank you to all of you who responded when we asked you to respond to the invitation. Some of you wrote back to us with your comments about what you think is important at this intersection of technology and health. 
And some of the comments that we heard from you were about, gee, you know, I really wish that my own preferences, my values, my desires could be reflected in the healthcare record much better and in my interactions with providers. Others of you said, Joy, I wish that the data I have about myself could be more visible to the healthcare system. Others were talking about, I'd love to have it when I'm at home, some of the things that are going on, I could more conveniently communicate to other people. So there were some ideas that you had about how technology could help with health. And that really sparks the conversation that we have tonight. So I'm delighted that we're going to be here and we're going to engage in this discussion. Um, we're going to start with some framing remarks from, from two, two wonderful people who are wise guides and supporters and friends of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing and of me personally, um, the leadership of our National Advisory Council, Dr. Russ Bell and Dr. Joanne Dish. And as they stand up and step forward, I'll just introduce Dr. Russ Bell, um, is chair of our National Advisory Council, and before he retired, was senior vice president for Beckman Coulter and chief scientific officer. And he's also a hospice volunteer in his home community of Helena, Montana. And he's been a, a leader for our National Advisory Council for many years, and we appreciate that tremendously. And Dr. Jo Joanne Dish is a professor at Honorum at University of Minnesota School of Nursing and a healthcare executive that I've admired for decades. And so we're so delighted you're our co-chair. So I invite the two of you to make some framing remarks. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm, all, I'm glad you're all here. The, the world of healthcare as we know it in the United States, uh, it's how do we resolve the issue that the United States spends more on health care than any country in the world, almost 20% of our gross domestic product. And yet, I think we could say outcomes are at least suboptimal and, and much worse than many other countries. Even President Trump has weighed in on the issue when he tweeted, who knew health care was so complicated? <laughs> And uh, there's a famous uh, uh, professor at Harvard, Michael Porter, who's written many books on competition, how to get ahead, strategy, and so forth. <clears throat> he wrote a book uh, some years ago called Redefining Healthcare. And he actually used a phrase which has stuck in my head because he said, healthcare in the United States is a dysfunctional family. And what he meant by that is, there are many interests in healthcare, payers, providers, device companies, pharmaceutical companies, physicians, and so forth. And it seemed like each member of the family was kind of sub-optimizing on their issues. Um, so the real question is how do we, what is the Betty I. Marine Moore School, what's their piece of the, of the action to actually improve outcomes? through education. So, thank with that. Step up here quickly. Yep. Good evening, and I want to extend my uh, welcome as well, and I'm going to use a little technology to tell a personal story. Um, I want to link together some of the things that uh, this event really represents in a, in a slightly different way, perhaps, or uh, amplifying what Heather said. First of all, um, the topic. It affects everybody in the country uh, at all levels. And the idea of personalizing something that in part of our country can be done very easily, or it seems easily to us, it's behind the scenes, but in the most personal service that we can ever experience, healthcare, it is almost absent. And so how do we take a look at something that is so important to all of us? So the topic is crucial. If you add that to the wisdom of the faculty and staff of the School of Nursing to have a community conversation that is so powerful and not something that we often see in communities around the country. We have either schools of nursing deciding what they think or schools of medicine or the PTA, but to bring together intentionally diverse perspectives to take a look. So the topic of community conversation, and then I'm biased, but the fact that it's hosted by the School of Nursing. This is a unique resource, not only to this area, to California, but to the country. And so this idea of personalized care is especially meaningful to nurses, not just nurses, physicians care, social workers care, diabetes educators care, 
Uh, we all have to work together, but nurses are the largest population in healthcare. We are everywhere, which is, I think, the good news, but you know, two in the morning in the hospital and on the weekend in your home and in your child's school. So nurses are everywhere. So we have a, a lot to say and a lot to share so that, that the, the fact that this is hosted by the School of Nursing I think is really remarkable. So put those three things together and I think we're going to have a fascinating uh, conversation with our panelists. The final thing I would share with you to maybe add even a dimension is that we really want personalized care. It's, we hope, cost effective, uh, certainly more efficient. But I would say this is about a humane initiative. And this is why I wanted to share this brief story that a friend of mine had told me. And so I said to her, can you remind me of some of the details of Gus's story? This is a story about Gus. Well, Gus was a tall man. He was a patient in their health system, a large health system out in the East Coast. Uh, everything about him was big and strong. He was a beloved husband, father, father-in-law, grandfather, the family patriarch. Now, his name, his legal name was Harry, which was an Americanized version of his Greek name. But pretty much all legal documents were called Harry, but many members of his family didn't even know that that was his legal name because he said to everybody, friends, family, co-workers, call me Gus. That's who I am. Call me Gus. So Gus, unfortunately, had an extended stay at this major number one healthcare system on the East Coast. And I won't go into the details, but he had pancreatic cancer, cancer. He had a Whipple procedure. I mean, he was in the hospital with many complications over months and received extraordinary care. So every time he was asked in the hospital, he would say, call me Gus. Call me Gus over and over again. Now, the name on his chart, on his ID bracelet, in his electronic health record with all of the marvels of technology, what do you think said? Harry. Harry. And guess what everybody called him? Harry. Harry. So regardless of what was on the technologically advanced materials, the paper charts, the ID band, what he begged, his family said, call him Gus. Everybody called him Harry. And so the family is still struggling with the indignities of this lack of recognition of his name, but more important, his personhood, his identity. He was not Harry. He was Gus. And if we can't get something as basic, which is partly technological, but partly the systems, partly the intent, the will, the ideas, the execution, how are we going to personalize health care if we can't do it for somebody like Gus. So to me, what we're talking about here tonight is a beginning conversation, I would mm -hmm. say, or one that's been ongoing in the school, but now with community partners, that is not only personalized care, whether it be technological, and technology doesn't have to be a piece of equipment. It can be technology of processes and that. But personalized, certainly safer, but I would say humane is what we are trying to begin to explore and discuss tonight. So we are thrilled to have you here, and I really look forward to the comments by our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Russ and Joanne. So our panelists tonight, I would, I'm so thrilled to introduce to you on my far left, Lewis Burns, who before he retired was the Chief Executive Officer of Care Innovations, and prior to that led up Digital Health for Intel and is a member of our National Advisory Council. We're very grateful to you for that. Kristen Miranda, who was part of our, our discussion at that time, you were with Blue Shield, and now you're with Agilon Health um, as the Chief Integration Officer and California Market President. Welcome, Thank Kristen. You. And then Dan Weborg, who's with Kaiser Permanente. He's, um, he's an incredible scholar and nurse, and his area, his, his position is as the Director of Nursing Research and practice innovation for Kaiser Permanente with the Nurse Scholars Academy. So we're delighted to have all of you here. Some of you notice on the program that we're supposed to have Tom Nesbitt here with us tonight, who's the um, Associate Vice Chancellor for Strategic Innovations at the UC Health System. 
and he was called to be present at the National Board of Advisors meeting for the School of Medicine tonight, and so he sends his regrets. And I know that we will confidently fill in his portion of the program, a third each from our other panelists. <laughs> So we came here to talk about my, my smartphone's personalized, but my healthcare is not. And I'd be really interested to hear from the three of you. What, what do you think about the role of technology in healthcare, around, particularly around that question and the poignant issue that you raised, Joanne, about personhood and dignity? How do we advance that with technology? You go. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, I'll dig in. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I do want to say I'm delighted to be here. I, um, the, the dinner that Heather mentioned um, was an extraordinary night, actually, because um, I came away from that not only having learned a great deal, but also having, uh, I guess, great hope for sort of the future of healthcare in this country. I think what you are building here and um, the way that you're looking at creating the next generation of leaders in healthcare was just, for me, really inspiring. So very happy to be here tonight. I guess what I would say is I think about healthcare a bit differently now than I did seven months ago. So I had been working, as Heather mentioned, at a large health plan, Blue Shield of California, and what we were really struggling with there was just the fragmentation of information, right? We were a bit arm's length away from patient care, although I was involved in building a program where we really were looking at very tight integration between our physician group partners, our hospital partners, and the health plan. So one of the big initiatives that our CEO, Paul Markovich at Blue Shield, um, had embarked on, and it frankly sounded at the time kind of... Um, um, pretty aspirational, I think four years in, it's still aspirational, but it's the right vision, was how do you take a system in California, well, not only is the healthcare delivery model incredibly fragmented and certainly sub-optimized, no doubt about that, but where the information is fragmented as well, right? In California, you've got some pieces that um, are with the state, you've got some pieces that are with the federal government, you've got some pieces that are with the plans, and you frankly have got a lot of information now that is um, in the hands of delegated providers who take risks for services, right? So an incredibly fragmented information system. So I spent a number of years focusing on getting this statewide health information exchange off the ground. It was really envisioned to be, still is envisioned to be a public utility. And it, we brought together, uh, Blue Shield actually worked with Anthem to come together and actually um, fund it. You can imagine how providers uh, felt about two large health plans coming together to try to get information shared. <laughs> there were some obstacles in, um, in sort of getting that trust going. Um, but the vision was the right one. I think what we underestimated was the incredible challenge of, uh, of getting information in the right hands in a system where you've got independent physicians practicing, you've got some large integrated delivery systems. Certainly Kaiser has got a great advantage in terms of owning kind of the information that really drives patient care. But it's enormously challenging. They've made a huge amount of progress, and um, I think we'll, I, I hope we'll ultimately kind of get to the promised land in California because I think it'll solve a fair amount. Seven months ago, as Heather said, I, uh, I left Blue Shield and was one of the earliest executives starting a brand new company that is largely around helping physician groups come together and create the right clinical infrastructure, the right technological infrastructure, and the right kind of administrative structure to enable them to take, take on risk, particularly around government programs. So in California, we have about 480,000 Medicaid lives. Technology now, from my perspective, is a very different picture. So we've now got patients that are part of our um, family who in some cases don't have homes, but interestingly enough, have got smartphones. And so we are really trying to take sort of a, a, a small piece of what's out there in terms of technology and leverage it around, obviously, the basic things like appointment times, but also transportation needs, all of those kinds of things. So I guess what I would say is my view of which layer of technology we're kind of looking at and how do you sort of um, drive change through that has really changed pretty dramatically just given... Um, uh, a very different stakeholder that I'm now interacting with. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> from my perspective, even in an integrated system where we can know someone's really history from birth to death, um, it's hard to personalize that. And I think 
Part of that is because <clears throat> the, when you look at your smartphone, you give it data. You give it permission to personalize. When you go on Amazon, you give it permission to know what you shop for. When you go into Facebook, you tell it who your friends are. But, every, but in healthcare, the health system owns your data. You can't tell it anything other than what maybe, maybe what you want to be called. And everything else is owned by them and charted by them, and you have no input into it other than what you say translated through some care provider. And so there's, it's very hard to translate in that into personalization because you, you're not, you, your information's not there the way you want it to be. And so you're relying on somebody to, to figure that out and turn it into data that then is relevant to you. And I think that's the biggest problem. Even in an integrated system, we have trouble with that. But what's really interesting is, you know, if you can get a lot of data together, who translates, translates that into personalized care are the frontline people. They're very good at that. And, and they've overcome all these barriers related to technology and information. And if they take the time to get to know the person, then you get personalized care. The technology right now I see in healthcare is actually getting in the way. Um, and most of it is because the patients don't have access to input their own data now. And the latest technology I think we have to that is everyone's focused on these wearable things, right? How many steps you have. So now your personalization is going to be, well, great, you walked 20,000 steps, but we're still not going to call you the same thing, and we don't know who your network is, and we can't refer you out to your community partners because we don't really know where you live, you know? And so I think we have a long way to go, um, and I think we have to flip the equation into um, us as patients, as as um, uh, you know, consumers um, being able to input our own information and, and managing some of that and not just solely handing it over to be translated by a health system. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> a couple of things to start with. Uh, Moore's law is still true today as it was back in the mid-60s. And so what I will tell you from a technology point of view, I spent 30 years at Intel doing a variety of issues, including the healthcare, is that beat rate has not changed. And so the level of technology, the acceleration, the type of things you can do with technology, it's just, just going to continue independent of where it's used, self-driving cars, whatever you want in the process. The issue in healthcare is not a technology issue. There's more technology than they can use. You have artificial intelligence-based systems that could go out and access and integrate all that information for you on whatever device. In many cases, it's just really a choice, is do we want to give access? I think you raise a really interesting point is, the, your health, your, let me say it out loud, your health care information is owned by the hospital system. The your part of my health care information is owned by somebody else is a fundamental issue that evol eventually has to be resolved. Exactly. I get why. There's all kinds of issues around it. But if you gave access to a smartphone with an artificial intelligence engine on it and said, tell me how I've done the last six months in whatever it is, it could easily figure that out for you instantly. So technology is not the issue. It's trying to find a way through decisions to actually take advantage of it so that people can access it. By the way, the technology also would make it simple for whatever the level of the user is. If you can ask a question on the phone to a doctor, you could ask the same question on your phone to a system and it will answer that question for you. So I think it's a lot of this is about choices and the way things have been for decades. Can, can I just yeah. um, respond to something that Louis, Louis just said? Because I think it's so fundamental. I think one of the biggest struggles we're going to have across the country, honestly, is part of what you just said. Whose data is it, right? We, I, I will tell you that um, I, we went into building this statewide health information exchange, I think somewhat naively, and didn't quite fully appreciate the extent to which each stakeholder has got a vested interest in keeping that data. And each stakeholder has maximized and optimized their piece of the pie, and that is continuing to kind of drive this fragmentation. Um, the data, at, uh, the, the premise that we started with in trying to create this thing in California, I think is the right one. The data does not belong to the plans. It does not belong even to the providers, with all due respect. It belongs to the patient. And as they are moving through the system, they're changing states, they're changing health plans, they are uh, in an emergency room unable to communicate in a totally different area. That information has got to be, um, has got to go with them. So I'm, I'm going to give that as a very short little plug for the, for, uh, for CalIndex, the, the California Statewide Health Information Exchange. But I think it, it really raises, clearly there are issues of security, right? And, and there's a lot of complexity around that. Um, how do you deal with behavioral health data? I mean, there's all kinds of very legitimate barriers and challenges to creating kind of an integrated 
um, information exchange. But I think you're right. Fundamentally, it's really not the technology. It's really sort of the will and bringing the stakeholders, bringing the right stakeholders to the table and somehow getting alignment across them. And it, it, it's, uh, it's not easy, and I don't think it's going to be easy. Can I, get, I want to give one example. This is uh, people who have got elderly parents as an example, and they're in assisted living, whatever level that is. Uh, the company that Doug and I started together with the merger with some GE companies, um, we had the ability in an assisted living facility through some simple sensors and some software to derive after a few days what mom's patterns are. It's not hard, believe it or not. It's really a simple technology issue. We know she gets up normally once a night. She normally gets up between 1 and 1.30. Um, she normally leaves her room at 7.25. She normally comes back at 8.30. Um, all those issues, pretty straightforward. And if she starts getting up two times a night or three times a night, we probably got a UTI issue coming. If she's not going to the cafe, or the, they call them cafeterias and restaurants, depending on the first, at her normal time, she may be depressed, right? And then with some other simple things, you can see after taking the meds. All that's simple to do from a technology mm -hmm. point of view. You know what's hard? Is getting okay to tell the caregiver what mom's been doing. It would seem yeah. to me if you're the caregiver, you'd want to know a mom's been sick, a mom's been up twice the last three nights, can you actually go talk to her because she may not be drinking enough water? So many of these things, like I said, it's just a simple way of ex uh, exiting the point is it's simple technology-wise. It's really about change and how you think about things. By the way, I want to be really clear. There are no bad actors in this process. I'm not saying that the people that run the homes or the people that run the healthcare systems or people that run into are bad. It's just the way it's always been done this is a huge change, and it's not easy. So no bad actors, big opportunities, though, if we can get people to change how they think and act, attack on this. Who do you think has to change? Who, who has to change first? Where do you, you're all talking about the need for that, and it's, it's they, very- Clearly, <laughs> they do. I think, <laughs> you all need to change. No. <laughs> um, well, I, so I'll, I'll say the statement I said on the phone call, which is healthcare is about 20 years behind the rest of the world in everything, Correct. and education's about 20 years behind that. So if we talk uh -oh. about smartphones, <laughs> we're like pre-cell pre phone or maybe in Morris code related in education, and then in healthcare, we're like the Zach Morris, like big, you know, MASH, like <laughs> huge phone that you got to, you know, that radar spun up so he could call, you know, Korea or whatever. So. I mean, we're, we're just, we're so far behind and we're with the banking industry, although they're a little bit farther ahead, still industrial revolution organizational structures. And so we're really hard to, it's really hard to change. I would like to see healthcare education be a lot more disruptive. I think we could disrupt a lot of things that way, um, especially around, you know, how we educate people and, and get out of this generalist mindset and really push to be, to create these innovative leaders that can disrupt healthcare. So I think it can start there. Um, and then I think the consumers need to demand more. Um, you know, there's a big play, and there's a lot of big players that that listen to that could listen to consumers with you know with the right with the right tone. I think, you know, two years ago I was at Epic, a big EMR company, um, and they were talking about we have 80% of the market and blah 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 blah. And I said, so what? Is, how are they going to keep making money when they have every hospital system up on Epic? Then they're going to flip it, and they're going to start giving your records to you because you're, they're gonna have it all. And then you're gonna be able to shop around, pay some monthly fee and go to whatever hospital you want because you have your own record through Epic and they'll charge you a monthly subscription fee and then they'll have 60 billion people that have their own record and are paying subscription fees and then they'll own everything and Judy Faulkner will be you know, up in space on their, you know, the Elysium or whatever. So you know, there's just, that, that's, I think there's a way for us to push the envelope and actually flip the market a little bit and demand differently. Um, and I think healthcare systems are starting to get it because people are able to shop around and there's a lot of disruption from places like Silicon Valley, which are putting in fragmented solutions right now yeah. to disrupt, the, the, you know, disrupt these things. But the consumer, they're running on consumer demand. They don't, they don't even understand how Kaiser works. They have no idea what happens within Kaiser walls. They just know it's a big system with a lot of money and they want to pitch to us. But they're creating solutions based on the need that they experience or their family experiences. And that's going to drive change because you're going to be able to not have to go to Kaiser to get stuff done. And you already don't have to. You can go to where you can go to these apps. You can go to these, these minute clinics. You can go to these little pop-up 
um, stands where there's really good professionals providing really good care for more efficiently and more effective and safer than any health system can. And that's driven by consumer demand. So I would say we need to be louder. And then the, lar the smaller we, which is nursing, needs to be louder because we're at the center of all this change. And we just need to stand up as a profession and really disrupt a lot of things because we're at the nexus of where all this connects. So. Yeah. I, I guess what I would add to that, I mean, Tom's exactly right. I think um, it's too easy just to say sort of every stakeholder needs to change, right? But the reality is every stakeholder needs to change. And I think part of what makes me hopeful uh, right now is that there is such a sense of urgency, right? The economic model, I mean, we're, we're heading off a collective cliff. There's no doubt about that. There's not a single stakeholder in healthcare right now who doesn't recognize that uh, kind of incremental change and in business as usual is over. We've got very little, ooh, very little time now to, to fix. Um, I'm feeling a little bit wacky with the Madonna thing we have going on here. <laughs> anyway. Just, just don't dance. Yeah. yeah, right, no, trust me, nobody wants that. Um, but I think uh, the economics are continuing to, to sort of constrict, right? We are having, and, and what that's driving is some really interesting things across the country in terms of previously very separate kinds of stakeholders coming together now in ways that probably five years ago, I certainly would not have predicted. One example of that actually really was the two largest health plans in California that compete fiercely coming together to say, guys, uh, we can't possibly continue to, um, to drive the kind of transformation that we're going to need to drive to survive, right, let alone to sort of, you know, move the economy forward um, without actually being cooperative on some levels, right? You're seeing it. There are, there, the lines are blurring between health plans and providers. And I'm not talking now just about providers going out and integrated delivery systems going out and deciding to compete. That's frankly just continuing to fragment the market. It'll keep happening, but it's fragmenting the market. What I'm talking about are fundamentally different stakeholders coming together going, wow, guys, we can't do this the way we used to do it. Look at what Aetna and Banner have done in Arizona in saying we've got to start sharing information. The lines are blurring. That makes me really hopeful that, um, frankly, it's driven by the catastrophic situation that we're in. Right? There's nothing like, you know, an absolute disaster <laughs> to sort of start to kind of um, change how we're fundamentally functioning. But I think, um, I, I, as I said, I think that we are going to continue to see some uh, really oddball things happening, and I think that's what we're going to see transformation. It's not going to be incremental around the edges anymore. We had a term for that called coopetition, mm -hmm. working closely with your competitors because it's the right thing to do, and it's a yeah. really hard thing to learn because you want to beat their brains out in a legal and ethical way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to cooperate at times to try to solve real problems. Back to the other issue about what would I tell the technology industry? Yeah. Um, we see every problem as how you can solve it with technology. And like I said, I, the examples are really pretty straightforward. We are terrible at listening. Mm -hmm. You got a problem? I bet you if you know, some of the CEOs of hospitals had a dollar for every technology company came in and told them how to fix their problems, they would be retired and not worried about this. <laughs> so as an industry, we have to really learn to listen and understand what the issues are, because it's not a technology issue. It's mm -hmm. a process issue. It's the way things have always been done. There's a real regulatory issue. Mm -hmm. So from the industry I grew up in is, Listen, my mom and dad, my dad had this saying is you had two ears and one mouth, use them proportionally. And I think the industry could learn a lot from that saying mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Can I add just one mm -hmm. thing to that? Um, one of the other things that I think is very interesting is that part of what it takes to build a really great delivery model is certainly not only reducing fragmentation and getting um, sort of the right information in the right hands at the right time, but there are also infrastructure costs and build. And I think that what we're also starting to see is the financing mechanisms of healthcare are really starting to change. And you're beginning to see, and we could debate, and maybe we will later, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we, you really are beginning to see stakeholders who've not previously had a real big hand in pieces of healthcare going and starting to work with physician organizations, providers to help them build what it will take to really create a much more integrated um, delivery model. And I think that's, I think that's interesting. When you're seeing big companies in tech that are going after healthcare big time, I mean, Salesforce is huge. Oh, they have yeah. a whole global thing for healthcare. They're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. GE Google. has always been in there. Google's Look been in there. Google's Apple. Doing. Samsung, Apple, Microsoft is now trying to get back in the game. I mean, 
they see the market and they see the disruption and they know when there's disruption they can get in and hopefully get in the ground floor and be able to innovate up. So um, I'm worried. But they don't know what I, to do yet. I listen to this and I worry and worry about the people we're trying to care for. So how do we, yeah. how can we use technology for good? I mean, what, what do you see as the most important places where we should be thinking and deploying technology to actually improve lives for real people? Just because chip everybody. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> um, I'll start with that. I, I have a special place in my heart for taking care of our elders. I grew up in, I was the fourth generation raised in the farmhouse I grew up in. And so my dad's dad lived with us till the end of his life, and my mom's mom lived with us. And so you kind of this whole thing about elders. And we know for a fact that you can put simple technology in the home and check on mom every day in a way that she's comfortable and that we know, you know, if the visiting nurse saw her Tuesday and they don't see her until two weeks on Tuesday and on Wednesday she's not doing well, that may get missed. So we know, we know it can be done. We've seen it done in massive pilots. The VA's got a massive deployment of trying to take care of veterans. Is can I keep people in the place they prefer to be and let them be safe and confident and then deal with the issues as they deal with the issues, right? Not just when they come in for their doctor's appointment or when they roll on a, an ambulance. That's a place I'd like to see us go right out of the chute. Yeah. Elders deserve that, and we ought to do a better job for them in their homes. Hmm. Kristen, what do you think? Where should we go for Well, totally agree with that. You know, honestly, and as I said, maybe now I've got a very different perspective because of the, um, we're very focused on kind of the, you know, the underserved in California. And I guess I actually do think that some of it's pretty basic. Um, certainly the home monitoring stuff that Lewis mentioned ha opens up just tremendous opportunities um, for patient care and for, you know, much better outcomes. Um, I think truly some of the basics like pushing out appointment times, making sure you're helping patients coordinate transportation, sending all of that to them on their smartphone. Um, uh, gaps in care that we're able to communicate with um, physicians much more real time and also in turn go out and communicate with patients um, to, to sort of link that those two pieces up. So to me, some of the just really basic frontline stuff that just hasn't been leveraged or deployed in the right way, I think that is, just, I think there's just huge opportunity even there. I would say just the first thing is get all our nurses' smartphones in the hospital. I mean, yeah. we, we have 38 hospitals. One of them, two of them have smartphones for our frontline nurses. I mean, that's, that's that, silly. What does that do for them? It gives them information at real time. Right now, they're carrying around Cisco phones that can, that can text when you push three, four times to get D and that kind of stuff. And they can't even communicate effectively. And so if we can at least enable our, our frontline you know, staff, clinicians, care providers with some sort of real-time information, um, better personalized information for them because they own the data right now. So let's personalize for them and then and then move it out. And then I, I think home health is huge, yeah. huge piece. And that will, yeah. that will I think, really reduce costs too. You know, I think it's interesting too because we were talking about some of the, the companies that are doing this really you know, fancy, sexy stuff. Like, I mean, some of the stuff that Google is coming up with is just, it's, it's unbelievable. But in order for that to benefit uh, anyone, it's got to be integrated into a delivery model mm -hmm. and deployed, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. right yeah. And that's why I think those of us who are kind of on the front lines of this stuff, I, that stuff is great and clearly there's a lot of promise for, you know, what that can drive in terms of patient care and outcomes, but I, I feel like there is so much basic blocking and tackling that we could kind of accelerate just by, you know, some of the stuff that, that we were just talking about. Yeah. We're going to have speed round in one second, but in the meantime, if you have questions or comments that you've written down on your little cards that you have that when you sat down, pass them to the center, and we'll ask the panelists your questions. And in the meantime, while you think about doing that, I'm going to ask the speed round question, which is, if you could disrupt one thing in healthcare with technology right now, what would you do and why? Want me to go first? I think so. Okay. I say, I say education, and specifically nursing education. I think we could do a lot better um, disrupting the NCLEX as a board standard, as a licensing standard. I think we can disrupt the way we do, do generalist education and actually create you know, more innovative leaders. Um, and I think technology can accelerate a lot of things um, to engage our students better and, and prepare them to hit the ground running instead of sending them into another nebulous residency that they have to learn, relearn in an in a industrial revolution organization how not to be a nurse when what they learned in, in education. So anyway, that's... 
Let's Perfect. try to be speedy. Well, we need you to be a consultant <laughs> in our school. Clearly. Happy to do it. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it again, but I will. I really, a patient, our um, home care, I, I think they're just meeting patients where they are, wherever possible, I just think is, um, is transformational. Uh, something Doug taught me, force multipliers. If I can have a nurse be able to take care of 300 elders from the phone, because the technology helps her deal with the ones that need help, I would look at things that you can use technology to be a force multiplier, to enable them to, and there's nothing better than a nurse one-on-one -on -one with the patient, because they know what the hell they're doing, and it matters. How do I enable them to have those experiences when they're needed, right, versus chasing other things? That's what mm -hmm. I would do. So I'd, I'd go after force multiplication. Fantastic, thank you. Are there any questions from the audience that have been passed forward? Debbie, did you get a, a list of questions? I'm going to in just one moment. I see people are rushing forward with them. <laughs> it's Mike Douglas show. Yes, Mike Johnny, what do you have? Okay, here's question number one. How can we get to truly patient-centered team-based care by the healthcare provider most well aligned with patient goals, not based on initials after name? Education. <laughs> <laughs> Train them together, make them work together from day one, and move it forward. I think that's, I mean, really, that's a big foundation for us. And then I think we have to deconstruct the idea of leadership within an old, you know, model of, of organization, which is titles matter, position matters, and really the future of leadership is influence. And so if you influence better, then, then that's, that's what should be valued more than the oak desk that you sit behind. Yeah. Um, but what do you need to build for the future, right? And how do you train um, future healthcare leaders to um, have very different kinds of skill sets um, to really drive transformation in the future? And Tom's exactly right. Um, what impressed me about what I think you're building here is really looking at creating leaders who will go out there in the field and um, help drive a dynamic where it's really not about the initials after your name, right? But it's really about skills of influence, um, all those kinds of things that, um, uh, that I really think uh, will, will drive change. And I think, I, I feel like it's starting to happen. I maybe, I'm crazy, maybe it's the practices that I've been interacting with over the years, but I really do feel like that's starting to happen. <coughs> Okay, here's a great one. Who's figured this out already? Is there a country that is doing this already? I, I spent a lot, you guys will find this funny. I've got two, mile, two million miles on United, but after this week, I'm not sure I'm gonna go back, but that's what <laughs> I made damn sure I paid for my seat and I was bigger than the guard, but that's, um, so I've seen the, the UK system. I've been throughout Europe and looked at their systems, and the answer is no. Because for everything that you like about a single payer system, there's 10 things that are wrong with it. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you get in to see a doctor? How are the professionals motivated? You know, you can go from place to place. I've been in Japan. You know, Japan at one time, the uh, average hospital stay was 10 days. And if you been to the hospitals, they're like hotels. But that's when their economy was go, 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 boom and boom, and the economy's tipped over. They're trying to figure out how to pay for it. So I can't say of a place that, I don't know, Doug, if you would say that you can go, that's it. You know, Canada's got a lot of advantages, got a lot of disadvantages, so uh, haven't seen the perfect place. I think that's true, unfortunately, but as I said, I, I see pockets of some really exciting things happening across the country, and again, for me, I think a lot of the future is gonna be about different stakeholders coming together and creating completely yep. new models, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so I, I'm, I am, uh, I'm hopeful. So if you imagine the cohort of seniors 20 years from now, what kinds of technology would care professionals need training in in the near future? So what's the technology that's going to call for our healthcare professionals to be trained in their use? I skip. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, we just, we're, I'm working on the Kaiser Permanent Day School of Medicine that we're building, and so we're writing curriculum and trying to think, you know, the, the first class doesn't start till 2019, and then they're going to graduate in 2023 or something. So we're trying to figure out, like, what is the future clinician in 2023 need to learn, and then write that curriculum now. So that's very hard. Um, but I think, 
I, the, the phone obviously is going to be the crux, or some virtual assistant thing is going to be managing most of the day and most of your data. I think that's you know school clinicians are going to be less about memorization and more about integration. And I think that's the biggest skill that we have to learn. I don't think that I think technology is going to be intuitive, and the more and more we go, it's going to be natural for us to speak into something, and it's going to do it, or it's going to read our thoughts, or whatever is going to happen in the next 20 years. But the key skill that we don't have right now is the integration of information from technology, from people, and actually doing something with it. It becomes task lists now. And I don't think we're preparing our providers and our nurses and everyone else to actually integrate multiple points of data and do something with it. We prepare them to memorize really great things about the heart. And I just saw a technology two weeks ago that takes MRI data in real time and turns it into a 3D model. You put on 3D glasses, and you can twist the heart around, cut it open, do fake surgery, know exactly what you're going to do. Hmm in real time from real MRI data. So it's, not, it's gonna be less about memorizing where the veins are in a body and more about what do we do to treat people like people and how do we integrate data to make decisions and then how do we, what do we do with that? How do we refer that, that information into something, whether it's a technology or intervention or something like that? And if I were to try to predict what would be needed in technology in 20 years, if I tried to do it in five years, I'd be wrong. Mm -hmm. I have, it, anytime somebody predicts what's going to be out there in five years, you know, they're getting paid <laughs> to talk about it. They don't know. Yeah. You, see, you don't know. It right. just moves too fast. Mm -hmm. Here's a disruptive question. Perhaps technology is the reason Gus was called Harry. His ID were all printed and recognized via technology, but the personal connection was lost. When don't we need technology? We talked about on the call was, you know, if you have broken processes, technology breaks it faster. Yes. And so <laughs> and we all agreed on that. And reliably. And reliably yeah, it reliably <laughs> breaks it. It breaks it every time. <laughs> so technology is never the answer. And this is, my, this is what, something yeah. I really believe. Technology is never the answer. Right. Technology exactly. enhances some process that's good or good enough for now. It's never a, a silver bullet. It can't be. It, it, exactly. it, it's built by us. It's built around our thought process, <laughs> and it's always flawed. And so, if we're putting it on top of the hairy, you know, thing, it's not, it's not going to work. So, great. So, the National Academy of Medicine has estimated that everyone will experience a diagnostic error in their lifetime. What is the potential of machine learning or artificial intelligence to improve diagnostic accuracy? And what do you think about MD Anderson aborting its effort to implement IBM Watson to diagnose cancer? Can we talk about the Middle East? No. <laughs> 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 fix Syria? That's good. Okay. No, no, oh. This one is your question. Um, please go ahead. There are. I mean, the, machine learning does have some. It, there's more and more things I'm seeing, especially at UCSF and some other places around using machine learning to actually be better um, predictive of what will happen, especially around early demise in, in hospital settings and taking multiple data in, running it through, and mm -hmm. predicting out better than what we have now. So I think there's a lot that could be there. But, you know, the human element, I think, for now is, is still the big issue, and it's the integration pieces. There's either too much data or there's not enough data, and people are making decisions off it, and that's what yeah. causes a lot of the errors, I think. I want to share a personal story about an error that could have killed my daughter. I have a daughter with special needs. She's been under general anesthesia 31 times now. We were in post-op. Nurse Vernon, God bless her, was there, and she'd been a post-op nurse for 30 years. A young resident who didn't look old enough to date my high school son at the time was late in her shift, and she prescribed the transition med, I, I won't get all the terms right, as she was coming out of anesthesia. And she leaves, and I tried to talk to the doctor about my daughter and the fact that she recovers. She comes out of post-op in a very different way and the, all those issues, and she didn't have time to hear me. So I see Nurse Vernon pick up the paper, and she goes, oh, damn it. And I go, what? She goes, nothing. And I go, no, what is it? She goes, she got the right meds, but she got the dosage off by 10x. And I went, high or low? She goes, she got it off low, so it wouldn't have killed your daughter, but it could have went the other way. So the safety system was Nurse Vernon. Mm -hmm. Now there's an example where the system should have said, are you sure? Mm -hmm. And where that could have helped. It still has human intervention. Mm -hmm. I will never believe the machines return loose. But there's a simple example where a simple technology could say, wow, that's really outside the norm. Mm -hmm. So my safety system, my daughter Claire's safety system they, that day was Nurse Vernon, thank God. Mm -hmm. This questioner wants you to expand on how the patient care, 
the patient role needs to involve. He or she says, personalization should be based on consumers making decisions about what they want and need, but the current system does things to patients. How does the patient role need to evolve? I, I, uh, active, uh, you know, you have people that are uh, going and try to pitch for somebody. I think people need to get smart as best they can, and it's easy through queries. Mm -hmm. They're not, it's, it's not gospel, and they need to be their own advocate. And if they're not yeah. capable of being their own advocate, find an advocate for them. I think that's a really important part of patient, independent of anything else. Yeah, and I think what you find, and this certainly won't surprise anybody in this room, but the degree to which um, patients are informed and their own advocates varies widely across different demographics, right? So what we're seeing, you know, what I'm certainly seeing now with um, such a focus on the Medicaid population is that there's a real opportunity there to um, arm them, and I'm seeing a friend and colleague of mine, Leah Morris, over there who knows a lot about, um, hi, a lot about this, this population, but um, I think there's a huge opportunity for us, and it's not sending flyers, and it's not, and we've got to figure out, I think, better ways to um, to drive patient education and to give them the tools to be their own advocates. This questioner says, there's a major effort to integrate physical and mental health care. Yes. But the barrier of information sharing is a wall to this integration. Yes. Any suggestions about that? So first you've got to solve the separation of physical and mental health yeah. care, and then you've got to figure out how to bring it together in the information world. I think that honestly is one of the most significant challenges that we've got right now. It's been completely bifurcated um, on multiple levels. One is just sort of the information exchange, another is how um, sort of those different pieces are financed within the healthcare system. Um, I have seen work that's made small inroads in that, and it's not really based on technology because that's really not the barrier there, right? The barrier there is all around um, approvals and privacy and all of those kinds of things. We had dealt with that a lot in that public health information exchange, and in fact, um, many of us were advocating fiercely that we had to have behavioral health information data in that repository. And it simply wasn't possible at the outset. We did not have the right stakeholders uh, sort of, you know, willing to, to allow uh, the integration of those two pieces of data. So what's happening now is it's, it's done on the ground where you can, right? I, I was involved in a lot of work where we took a large behavioral health company, brought it together with our company and sat down with our providers and said, what do you need to get? How often do you need to get it? We're going to just start building reports, and we had to go through all compliance and all kinds of legal barriers. But I think that is one of the singles, big, single biggest issues that we've got to face as a country. The impact of those two on each other, I mean, clearly you guys all, all know this um, better than most, it's, uh, it's a massive problem now that is leading to not only just increased costs, but huge suboptimized care. So I, I feel like we've just got to have a national conversation around. I think part of it is just there's there continues to be a bit of a stigma there, and I think that's why it's, it's one of the drivers to I think an unwillingness to integrate that data into um, a patient's healthcare record. Yeah, I think that one of the other pieces is we don't know what to do with the data. I mean, we're trained in kind of episodic care, um, and this is now longitudinal. So now you can see physical activity over. 10 years, what, the clinicians aren't trained to do that. And neither is our, our research hasn't figured out what that even means to disease states either. I mean, or wellness, really. I mean, if you walk 10,000 steps, that's a magic number everyone says, but does that impact your heart disease? Does that impact your blood pressure meds? Does that impact your diabetes? Maybe over time, but there's no, point, there's no decision made off of it. And so it becomes like noise in the background. So I think we have some work to do related to the evidence related to some of those things. Um, and then training people on what to do when you have longitudinal data and what does it mean and what does it translate to. Why don't we have our personal medical information on a card we carry like they do in France? Epic's going to do here. it. <laughs> <laughs> Epic's going to own the country if we don't watch it. <laughs> I mean, if you get to the issues, it, it changes, so it'd have to be a smart card and an active card so it would adjust. And then they got the whole issue of they lose them and things like that. Um, but it, they are more aggressive in the, the fact of who owns the data and 
that aspect of it. That's a good part, but the implementation's a little odd. Yeah. I mean, the VA has the blue button. You can download your information. There's, Epic has open notes, which you can download your information. I think it's starting, but it's not on a card that you can port around. People, I mean, there's, there's, there's benefit for the health plans to own some of that, because then you come back to them. <laughs> Otherwise, you could go shop around, right? And, and that happens with the opioid crisis and some other places, but... Um, I, I think that's one of the barriers, too, is the way this, that's the, that the system is set up, right? That's that information issue we keep talking about. Right. Yep. yep. So this is a good segue. How do we get rid of the paternalism that's so rampant in healthcare? says this questionnaire. Uh, <laughs> that goes way beyond yeah. technology. Yeah, the air went out of the room. <laughs> but, but there you go, Heather. Point your point turn. Point. Yeah, yeah, your turn, Heather. Actually, <laughs> I would like to hear No more free ride. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I want to hear Come Heather's on. response. Yeah, Let's exactly. go. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think it starts with values and who's, who's, who's this really about and what are we really trying to accomplish. And if, if we really take that seriously and if that's what drives our work, we would be asking the people we're serving what they need, what they want, how healthcare could be structured and should be structured, and it immediately flips the conversation from, hi, I'm the expert, I'm here to help. It's really about um, listening very deeply to what's needed in our society and looking and being willing to be self-critical about the many ways that we undermine that and the ways that we take away the power and the ways that we um, over, override our expertise in favor of what we believe is expertise when the people that we're serving really have the expertise about themselves, their bodies, their priorities, their values. And I think we miss that boat consistently. You know, one of the, I, I, that just, though, you just hit on exactly what, um, what excited me about the conversation that we had that night because uh, the sense I have is that that is what you are looking to build through this program, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, I mean, those are things that take a very long time. Those are such seismic cultural shifts, right, in how medicine has been practiced historically in this country. But I think that's how you do it, right? It's programs like this, it's conversations like this, it's, uh, it's nurse leaders like you. I mean, I think that's really how this starts to, to change. And I think it's the leadership in the moment. You know, we've had a lot of conversations about there's leaders at the top of organizations, but it's, it's leadership as a faculty member in a moment talking with a student or as a nurse in an encounter with a family that makes all the difference in, in, in showing the leadership in that moment about changing the way we're thinking and the way we're operating. Yeah, and I would imagine too, I'm not, I'm not a clinician, I would imagine too a sense of humility sort of bringing to, to the whole process and the whole interaction. Yeah, one of the things that we've been trying to do both in, in, in my organization and then also with the education side is integrate um, human-centered design principles as a foundation a foundational skill for the future clinicians. Because that, there's tools there and they're validated and they're taught at Stanford and, and they teach you how to walk in, walk in someone else's shoes or at least try to. So you can put on this hat of wh who is the user and if you can take that, and tech's been doing that for a long time. They, they, you know, the IBM's hired 8,000 designers to flip their engineering culture to be more design centered. Imagine if healthcare did that. What if we had every, a designer for every hospital that went through and actually designed the processes from the user standpoint? Yeah. I mean, and in education, we can do that now. There's no problem with putting that curriculum in. There's experts all over the place that can teach that. And I think if those are, those are just one set of tools that if we adopted, would give us a completely different view of what happens and maybe flip that, you know, I'm the doctor, I went through medical school, I've never been in a hospital, to, oh, this sucks. Like, I... <laughs> I don't want to get an IV. I don't want to spend the night here. I'm scared, and it's loud, and, and, and it just flips perception, I think. You know, I think some of it, too, and you can tell I'm a numbers gal, but I think some of it, too, is also creating an economic system where clinicians have um, the time mm -hmm. when they need it to really spend, and if some of it gets back to the team-based care model. It gets back to completely changing that sort of old-world um, model of how medicine's been practiced. But I think really we need to start um, aligning financial models with the transformation that we all say we want to see in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's still a real disconnect on a lot of fronts on, in that realm. Kathy, I feel an essential moment to notice your, your class. Kathy Kim of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, maybe just say one minute about your new class. Thank you. I get to promote this. So we <laughs> launched a master's entry program in nursing. 
Yes. We launched the master's entry program in nursing this year. Mm -hmm. And I had the honor of creating the first informatics course for this program. And what we created was healthcare technology and innovation. It's a design thinking course. Awesome. Oh, so great. all the nursing students learned human-centered design, user-centered design. Oh, very cool. They yeah. chose a challenge that they identified by interviewing patients, other nurses, mm -hmm. other physicians, and then they designed a solution for that. That's awesome. And That's they did hands-on prototyping in our lab to actually design that solution. So we're very excited that class. you like that. <laughs> and that's how healthcare gets changed, though. That's Absolutely. it. That's how the future changes. Okay, I see a guest lecture ahead, or a guest, <laughs> yeah. guest uh, design <laughs> moment ahead. It's a great book out there. I'll talk. So, Heather, we're coming up toward uh, uh, just a few questions left. What yes. are you feeling about your timing here? We have about five minutes. Okay, so. okay. Here's one. How can technology positively impact care for the underserved? What things are being proposed and discussed now? Lewis, you've been quiet. I have been. <laughs> I'm shy. Um, the, it's a softball question. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually an interesting question because you have to get, if you can propose or develop or deliver solutions, then people have to have access, right? And the one thing seems to be becoming almost ubiquitous, it's a word I learned at Intel, um, <laughs> is the phone, right? People who don't have an address have a phone. And so the question would be is, is, can you find a common set of technologies that you could depend on and then do you have a channel to communicate delivering those things down? Um, so I think that's kind of a common element which they'd work against. That makes sense. I think that's kind of the root of the question. Because yeah. you wouldn't want solutions that eliminated half of the population because of affordability or how hard it is to use or accessibility and all those issues. So the solutions have to understand that in my mind. Yeah, it really, honestly, um, at least in the work that we're doing, which is all about um, the underserved population, it really is, um, it, it is about access. And it is about leveraging technology to expand that access, right? So we've got um, telehealth programs that we are doing. We've got a lot of um, mobile um, programs that we do. We've got um, organizations that we partner with, like Partners in Care, that does a really incredible job at leveraging community resources, um, doing home care visits, all of that. And so I guess what I would say is uh, it's not solely focused on how is te how are we leveraging technology to kind of um, to, to meet those patients, but certainly technology is at the center of a lot of the initiatives. Yeah. And organizations need to take com command and, and actually go after underserved as a business model. I mean, you, you saw with the exchanges, some companies went in the exchange and they pulled out because they weren't profitable on the exchange members. You know, I'm proud to say that Kaiser said, we're going full force, we're going to figure out Medicaid and we're going to figure out this population and do something right. about it. And I think we need big organizations to make that bold statement and, and actually figure it out because, you know, even if they do have access, they don't know how to use it in many cases. So, you know, if you become a Kaiser member on Medicaid, you have a primary care physician, but we still saw our members go to the emergency room because they don't understand how to use the system. They never had a system. Right. And so I think there's a lot there. And maybe technology can help route them the right way. Maybe there's an easy way. Even text messaging has been proven to sh impact outcomes related to certain chronic diseases and things. So I think, yeah. I think there's some opportunity there. But we do, and we do, again, you know, we do need to, to create an economic model where organizations mm -hmm. can do it. Kaiser is a huge integrated delivery system. So uh, I think when you start looking at some of the smaller provider organizations across the state and across the country, that are trying to serve a Medicaid population, it gets much more challenging because you don't have the resources to build the infrastructure and all of that. And so that, again, I think it starts to get into some interesting, um, what did you call it? A collaboration, cooperation? What was it? Cooperation. The cooperation. Yeah. There you go. I can actually spell it because there is no <laughs> such word. <laughs> I like it. It's a, good, it's a good word. But anyway, I think, I think we've got to we will continue to see um, stakeholders coming together to figure out financing to start. It, it's such a huge part of the population and growing, not only in California, but across the country. So we will start to see more organizations like mine that are almost solely focused on how do we drive models that create excellent patient care and value um, across these government programs. Speaking of government programs, this questioner says, government is a major player in drug research, medical education, and of course, payment. But the current Secretary of Health and Human Services does not believe in evidence-based medicine. Uh, I think this questioner is asking not a partisan question, but a strategic question. 
What are the strategies to deal with a Secretary of Health and Human Services who leads that organization who doesn't believe in science? We're going to end with a softball. Yeah, what's the, I can what's tell. the neutral I just answer? Make it easy. <laughs> can I go back to the 2020 question and answer yeah. in that context? <laughs> 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 I, you know, we, I don't, it, I, I got nothing. There's so many things, you know, the earth's not getting warmer. There's all kinds of things. Science and data doesn't matter from what I tell. I don't know, to be quite honest. You can push, you can try to get people involved. You can, I, you know, Doug and I have had this discussion about getting active and, you know, sometimes it feels like you're screaming into a large sewer pipe and there's nobody at the other end of it. I, I, I don't know how to answer the question. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you honestly, I worry um, less about, uh, you know, we're going to throw evidence-based medicine out the window than I do about access. That really, for me, is the, is the biggest concern right now. And um, I guess what I would say is this, and I'd, I'd love to hear any thoughts you all have, but I, I, um, I think there's such a sense of urgency that healthcare really is, it, it is, um, it's unconscionable that in a country as wealthy as ours, we've had, you know, uh, so many folks who've had absolutely very limited access to health care other than in an emergency room. And I think there is a lot of alignment that we're starting to see kind of uh, brewing. And so um, I don't know that even um, someone as powerful as you know, Tom Price is going to be able to completely stop forward movement. Well, can I, thank can you. I, I want to, I wanna, for the community, I want to give a, a, a bit of feedback about the school. I got involved with them a year ago when Doug went off the board and I went on. I think you can tell a lot about an organization by how they behave. And, and the example I want to is this organization that Heather and the gang run, they ask incredibly hard questions on a regular basis. And they could throw us softballs on the board, but they ask really hard questions that frankly the answers aren't obvious, or in some cases I don't know what the answers will be. And I think that's an incredible sign that this organization is innovative, mm -hmm. is cares, it's courageous enough and comfortable in its own skin enough to ask questions they don't know how to answer, and that's how they get better. Mm -hmm. So I've been waiting for a venue to say that, and I just think it's fantastic, and we're lucky to have these guys, because they're, they're doing it in a way that I don't think has been done, and that makes me very hopeful. Thank here, you. Here. What a wonderful <laughs> way to, to end this panel. Thank you. Well, you can see why we wanted to bring our dinner to all of you. Um, and it was just such a wonderful conversation before, and it was just a beginning. Tonight was, was so rewarding and so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. I want to thank the sponsors for this program. The, uh, Dignity Health was a sponsor. Um, our alumni from the Master's Leadership Program. Would you mind standing? Because you were behind this. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Leah. And so many people who made this event happen, and I'm going to read because I don't want to miss a person. Sarah Mency, who really took the lead in this process. Sarah, go over there, thank you. Rebecca Badeau, behind the camera, right over there. Tina Brunello, who uh, makes sure that everything happens in the way of food and logistics and all the good things. Jenny Carrick in communications. Lizzie Mangini, Lori, Lori Hollingsworth in development advancement. <laughs> Sally Grace Tate, who's at the back. You all know Sally Grace. And Stacy Pasco. Thank you all. And so many others. Now please join me in a round of resounding applause for our wonderful panelists and our special <laughs> organizers. Well, the conversation can continue. Please talk to one another. Please find the panelists in our reception and enjoy some of our um, some, some good company and some good food. Thank you.